I think there's two things. One is we can learn from the history of experience. And many of the problems we're experiencing today are problems that have been experienced in the past. Uh, we should learn from that. Um, for example, I mentioned rubber. We have large companies going back to plantation rubber again. That doesn't make any sense from a historical perspective. The second reason is that a lot of what we see in terms of commodity production around the world uh, and its patterns is traced to uh, decisions that were made about land and labor rights in the past. So I, I gave examples of how oil palm, for example, shifted to Southeast Asia as a result of land policies in, in West Africa. So it helps us understand how and where products are being produced now. I think the rubber story is interesting in that it was a wild species, it was harvested wild, and then when you had the automobile industry take off around 1900, you had this huge demand for rubber. So you're looking for opportunities to make it into a cultivated product to be able to meet the supply. Uh, and there was a huge amount of experimentation done by many different companies and different species uh, to try to convert rubber from a wild to uh, a cultivated uh, species. Uh, and the current species, which is uh, Javier uh, brasiliensis, uh, was actually the one that the, the Malaysian colonial government and planters were experimenting with. Uh, and that's the one that worked. And so having plantations with deep pockets with the capital uh, the time and, and, and capital to experiment, I think, was important in that happening. But once you had the technology worked out, there was no reason that plantations had any comparative advantage in rubber production because it's a very labor-intensive crop. You have to go out and harvest it every day. It was ideally suited to smallholders. So when the colonial governments turned around around 1930, they said, oh, there's all these smallholders out there. They just hadn't expected, they hadn't counted on it. In fact, their policies had been hostile to smallholder rubber production. And then they just took it over. So you had this sort of progression. Uh, and I think there is a role for private capital in overcoming some of these pioneering risk uh, in going in establishing a new crop in a new area. Oil palm is a little bit different because you have to coordinate the harvesting very closely with the processing, and the processing is very large scale. Uh, but I think that's a problem that can relatively easily be overcome, particularly if you have organized smallholders or you have a very dense network of mills like you have now in Sumatra and in Indonesia. Uh, so I, I, I anticipate that oil palm is going to work very quickly towards or smallholder fraction, and, and it's particularly as the larger companies having problems accessing land and so on, they can solve a lot of those problems by outsourcing to smallholders, just the, just the same way as bananas were outsourced in, in Central America. I think it's, it relates very much to the certification question. I think with horticulture, you started off with standards. First of all, there were food safety standards for Europeans, very high uh, minimum standards. And then you had social and environmental standards on top of that. Uh, and, those, and they get more and more rigid over time. It was more and more difficult to get uh, smallholders to comply with those standards. So in certain horticultural commodities, uh, there's been a move toward, towards larger scale. Yeah. What kind of commodities do you, what, what are cultural commodities? Well, the one that I was looking at recently was uh, beans in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, for example. It seems like there's been a move back to, it went, it went small scale and then it's been a move back to more medium scale and some large scale. In terms of what I was looking at, I was impressed with what it, the, the, the progress in labor standards consistently over a century. I was impressed at how quickly in terms of the environmental standards on deforestation, we seem to be moving. It, it didn't, we didn't start on that until the 1990s and we seem to be moving in, in a historical point of, 
point of view very rapidly. But land is still, land rights and of, uh, of people affected by large scale investments. That's still uh, a work in progress. And uh, we don't have an international organization that's got the, the champions their rights, uh, and I, I think there's, there's a long, long way to go to establish some sort of minimum standards on land rights.